Come. Hello. I am here today with my three-year-old poodle pointer, Remy. You might be thinking Remy looks more like a German short hair than a poodle pointer with his short, slick coat. But as I like to say, he's got a short, sick coat. Pretty much the only thing I have to do to keep it maintained, groomed, and looking great is nothing. That really comes in handy when you have an indoor dog. Anyway, we are here today to show and demonstrate some of the things that I've been doing in preparation for the NAVDA utility test. Remy took the test last year and scored a prize three. He can do better. There's an old saying that says, don't practice until you get it right, practice until you don't get it wrong. Well, that's where we were last year. We practiced till we got it right and went into the test hoping for the best. Unfortunately, he faltered in a couple areas. So this year, after more training, ironing some things out and becoming more consistent, I hope to go into the test expecting the best rather than just hoping for the best. We'll see how that goes. Anyway, without further ado, let's get training. I should point out that I'm an amateur. I'm a novice trainer at best. There will be no professional or expert advice here. In fact, I've made a lot of mistakes along the way, but I've learned from those mistakes as well. Hopefully through the course of this video, I'll demonstrate and show some of those mistakes and lessons learned in hopes that it'll help somebody else is preparing for the, the NAVDA utility test. Oh, good boy. I should give props to the local chapter here in Utah the Wasatch Mountain Chapter. They've been a great resource to help train the trainer, so to speak. If I could give any advice from the get-go, it would be get involved with your local chapter and ask questions. There are a lot of different ways to train a dog and it's helpful to have some different perspectives. If you're unfamiliar with the utility test, it's broken up into three different sections. Each of the three sections has five areas in which the judges will evaluate and score your dog on. For the purposes of this video, we'll focus on the field group and water group. Each of these areas will be bookmarked for easy luck if you want to skip ahead or go back to review. The field group consists of search, pointing, steadiness on game, retrieve of shot bird, and retrieve of dragged game. Let's get started with the search. When you begin the search, the judges will probably tell you to just take your dog on a 30 minute hunt like you normally would. When I go hunting, my dog typically has a tendency to range a little farther than I like him to. That's not necessarily a bad problem. I'd much rather pull on the reins than kick him in the butt. But I've preferred that he work a little closer, so I have a series of hand signals and whistles that I use to, to get him to cover the ground more thoroughly. One thing to remember though, that is if you do give your dog a command that he does not listen to, that'll be a strike against you in the obedience score. The advice and lesson that I've learned is to give your dog as few commands as possible unless you are absolutely 100% sure that he's going to listen and obey. I've never judged a utility test before, but I've hunted enough to see a good searching dog and Remy's getting it done here. So I'm going to turn my focus and attention to other areas. The thing about pointing is a dog either has it or they don't. It amazes me how these dogs seemingly come pre-programmed and naturally point right out of the factory. If you think about it, these genes have been in development for hundreds of years through selective breeding. The best place to begin to get a good pointing dog is to find a good bloodline with these natural instincts. There are some things to do, however, to get your dog to stick the point quicker and to hold it longer, which leads into the steadiness aspect. The first idea that comes to mind is the use of a bird launcher. As soon as the dog gets a whiff of the bird scent, the bird is launched into the air. Or if any movement is made by the dog towards the bird after the point is established, then that too is going to trigger the bird to be launched and fly away. The dog realizes that the game and fun is over. The dog will soon learn to hold this point longer and longer and avoid any creeping tendencies. 
Having a bird launcher at your fingertips to launch the bird at exactly the right moment is key. Another thing I've done to help train the dog to hold the point longer is the use of an e-collar. Now this is controversial. Some trainers will stand by the golden rule that you should never use a shot collar with a bird on the ground as you don't want that negative influence of a bird uh, so that the dog will never want to go on point in the first place. While I do agree this is true for a younger, more impressionable dog, I do believe that used properly and at the right levels and the right time, an e-collar can be a, a very good training tool. Really the only time I'd ever want to use an e-collar when the bird is on the ground is if the dog were to jump in and try and catch the bird. In that case, I'd want to send a big fat no signal. Steadiness on game requires the dog to be steady to flush, wing, shot, and fall. You can see in this image from the NAVDA Test Rules publication the sequence of events. This is one area where we didn't do as good as we should last year when we took the test. Remy was so amped up that he broke on the shot. So because of that, I'll be spending extra time and dedicating extra effort to iron things out and get more consistent in this area. This is one of the first videos that was taken this spring after a long, lazy winter. You can tell he's a little rusty after being out of practice, but it's a good example of a dog that's only steady to flush. Anytime. Whoa. Whoa. This video segment is a perfect example of what not to do. Remy does a better job remaining steady to the flush and wing. But you'll be able to see he takes a few steps forward during the shot, which I don't Whoa. want him to do. And there it is. What my mistake was is I go up to him and I release him and send him after the bird. Yes, I know. Rookie mistake, rookie mistake. Basically what I did was reward him for not doing exactly what I wanted him to do and for being unsteady. What I should have done since I was training with other people is sent somebody else out to go retrieve the bird and made him sit and watch while I could sit back and make any corrections if he made any movements toward the bird. More temptation. It was a temptation. Ask any dog trainer the best way to create a good steady dog and they'll probably tell you to start with the whoa command and make sure they understand that well. So back to the basics. I use the whoa command and the single blast of the whistle interchangeably to mean the same thing. Come. When I whistle, that dog better stop and stay put. In this video segment, I'll demonstrate another one of my stupid mistakes or learning experiences. Even though I'm training with other people from our chapter, I take it upon myself to not only control the e-collar, but also the bird launcher, which are two things that you never want to get confused. So instead of launching the bird, I accidentally give a little zap to the e-collar and he doesn't know what to do, so he sits down, which is not something I'm trying to train the dog to do. Oops. Whoa! One thing I've learned about training a bird dog is you need birds. Lots of birds. Unfortunately, I don't have access to lots of birds like some trainers do. I've noticed that the dogs that are the most steady in our local chapter are the ones whose trainers have a loft with homing pigeons that they can use over and over again. Unfortunately, I don't have that luxury, so I've got to improvise. This is one thing I've come up with. I take the bird, pigeon in this case, and I tie a string around his foot with about a, oh, about a 10 to 12 foot length paracord with a, a ball on the end. Sometimes you gotta experiment with uh, different weights, but this one seems to work pretty good. 
So let's see how this works. The idea is I'm gonna throw the bird up. It's gonna fly about oh, 50 yards or so. It's gonna land, get tangled in the weeds and I'll be able to go pick it up and use it again. And it's down. So I'll get to go use that bird again. That'll be great. One of the challenges about training on my own, which I do most of the time, is it can get a little tricky to keep your eye on the dog all the time. This is important when you want to make your correction at exactly the right moment. In this situation, the bird doesn't fly real well, so I've got to take my eye off the dog to get the bird up in the air. You'll notice here that I'm not going to release the dog to fetch and go retrieve that bird. He wasn't real steady, but even if he were, I want to instill in the dog that it's not always his job to fetch and go retrieve that bird. Otherwise, he'll become like a spring-loaded trap with a hair trigger ready to explode, and that's not great for steadiness. You'll also notice here that as my back's turned, he moved a little bit, so I lost a, an opportunity to apply a little correction there. That's why it's really handy to have at least a second person there to fetch and go retrieve the bird so that you can keep your eye on the dog. Watching some of these videos after the fact and watching him move when my back's turned kind of makes me think I've been playing a game of red light, green light. In order to get a dog steady to the shot, you gotta shoot which adds more complexity to the process when you're training by yourself. Now I've got to keep one hand on the remote and try to shoot at the same time, which is not an easy task. It also doesn't help if the bird doesn't get up. You've got to take your hand off of something to get the bird in the air. Fortunately, because the bird's on a string and is going to fall anyway, I don't need to aim to get the bird to fall. Whoa! I think the name of the game here is repetition, repetition. Basically what I'm trying to do is de-intensify the dog, if that's even a word. I'm trying to get him so he's not so juiced up and ready to explode with anticipation. You might be noticing through the progression of these videos that Remy's starting to get more steady through the ring and shot, which is exactly what I'm trying to accomplish here. You might notice or pick up on that I always try to mix things up a little bit. Sometimes I'll shoot once, sometimes I'll shoot twice or even three times. I never want the dog to anticipate that it's time to retrieve a bird after a single shot. And as usual, I'm going to make him sit and wait and watch me go pick up the bird. One thing I like to do is pick around in the grass. Even if I know exactly where the bird is, I want him to get accustomed to that extra motion that's going on. If every flush and shot sequence was like this, I would be a happy camper. But we're working on consistency okay. here, so once again, I'm going to stay at it and go pick up the bird. One thing I try to remember, that positive reinforcement is probably more important than negative reinforcement, so I always want to show the dog some love. Good boy. He did so good on the sequence that I'm going to send him after a dead bird that I left where I just picked up the other bird. Whoa. I feel like we're finally getting to the point in the training where I don't have to keep one finger on the gun trigger and another on the e collar transmitter. We're making progress. You see the consistency coming along.
If you'll notice Remy's body language here, it's telling me that this is just another day in the office, and that is a good sight to see. This video was actually pretty cool. He hit the scent cone almost on top of the bird, yet he still had the reservation not to jump in and grab the bird. I was pretty happy with this sequence, so whenever he does good, I always gotta remember to show him some love. I can definitely tell that Remy's getting more consistent on his steadiness. He's by far a lot further ahead this year than he was at this point last year, so I'm happy with his progress so far. In this video, the string on the bird gets tied up in the weeds a couple times and really created a tempting circumstance for the dog. Yet, he's showing his steadiness is improving each and every day. Whoa! 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 Watching a dog stick a point just never gets old. That is so cool. I've been doing a lot of steadiness training on my own and he's doing pretty good. I gotta remember though that on test day, I won't be the only one there. There'll be a few judges, a couple gunners, so I've got to plan and anticipate the extra distractions. I've got to get some extra people to help me on my steadiness training. I don't do this every time, but something I think is a good thing to do is I go up to him and I pet him, soothe him, just kind of calm his nerves a little bit, let him know that what he's doing by being steady is exactly what I want him to do, and that's a good thing. Just kind of doing some positive reinforcement that he's doing a good job. One of the things I like about this video is he doesn't try and jump up and catch the bird in his mouth when it comes close to him. He's learning boundaries and that that's not his responsibility to do that. He also does a pretty good job following and marking the bird to see where it lands so that he can be ready to make that retrieve. Moving on to retrieve a shot bird. The idea here is the dog should quickly and eagerly fetch and retrieve the bird. Perhaps more importantly, the dog should deliver it to hand. Never should the handler have to give an extra command or step toward the dog to get the bird out of the dog's mouth. I'm just using bumpers here to make sure that Remy knows the game and how it's played. I'll go through several iterations of this just to make sure that he's got a really good understanding of, of what's going on here. Remy's doing pretty dang good with this exercise. He's got this game figured out. But 
the name of the game is retrieve shop bird, not just retrieve the bumper. So it's time to scrap the bumpers and get out some birds. It's a whole different game when the dog gets a bird in his mouth and can taste those feathers. So we're going to play the same retrieving game here, except this time we're going to use dead pigeons instead of those bumpers. You'll notice that he kind of pauses and hesitates a little more with the bird in his mouth than he did with the bumpers. This just shows that it's a whole different experience with a dead bird and taste of feathers in his mouth. But I'm confident with extra repetitions that he'll soon be able to retrieve the bird as quickly and eagerly as he did with the, the bumpers. He is doing a pretty good job of delivering to hand though. I don't have to give an extra command or even take a step toward, toward the dog. He's doing a pretty good job on his presentation. So he just jumped the gun a little bit on that retrieve and didn't wait for the command. I should have been ready to, to give a correction. Live and learn, live and learn. All in all, he didn't do too bad today in his retrieves and delivering to hand, even with the use of real birds. So it's time to up the ante and try something a little harder. Good boy, good dog, good dog. Sit. So I think the best way to evaluate a dog's cooperation and willingness to deliver to hand is after a water retrieve. The dog's natural reaction after it comes out of the water is to shake dry, which typically forces the dog to drop the bird in the process. A dog that will either shake with the bird in its mouth, or better yet, wait to shake until after the bird has been delivered to hand is a sign that the dog has mastered this skill. So here we are, the moment of truth and he stopped short of delivering the hand. And I got to give him a command to, to come closer. I did not want to send a message that I was going to go toward him. But there's the shake, so that was good. So we're going to try that again, and hopefully he'll do better the second time. And here we go, the moment of truth again. Better, except he didn't sit. I don't think that's a big deal during the test, but I'm aiming for perfection and want to see a better presentation. In the next couple sequences, I'm adding upon the building blocks. Not only am I using a dead bird, but I'm also using a gunshot to simulate a, a real testing scenario. You can see here that Remy's a little sloppy on the delivery. The judges do not want to make you take a step toward the dog to get the bird, so I had to tap my leg, which is in essence an extra command, and that would be a fault against him. I'm also going to take some extra time to take the bird out of his mouth. I don't want him anticipating that he's going to hand it over too soon. One thing I'm trying to do, though, is make sure these training sessions are in different areas just to let him know that even though it's a different place, it's the same game that's being played. And regardless of where he's doing it, it's the same job that needs to be done. I think Remy's got a pretty good handle on this so far, so let's move on to the next task. Although Remy did great on the Retrieve of Dragged game last year, I've noticed this year after a long winter, He's been out of practice and he's got a tendency now to just run out and start searching for the bird rather than trusting his nose and following a scent. I didn't really have a track command last year. So this year I've introduced a new track command so he can tell the difference between going out and searching and actually following a scent. You can see in this video that he followed the scent trail pretty well for this short drag. Didn't really need the check core on this case, but you never know, so it's better to have it and 
not need it, then need it, not have it. One thing to remember, this isn't necessarily a tracking test, although it will help on the use of no score, but the dog merely needs to find the bird and return it to hand. But if it can't follow the trail, it's going to make his job a whole lot easier. So in this video, I'm leaving a feather pile at the beginning of the trail as is usual. I'm also going to make this a little longer and put a couple bends in the trail. In the test, there should only be one distinct bend, but I want to train beyond the test and make it a little harder for the dog to figure out with different wind conditions and give him experience with that. After bringing him to the start of the track, he's not really sure what's going on. So i got to reel him back in and get him started on the beginning of the track again. When he starts off, he goes a little off course, so i got to use the check cord to get him back on track. Once I can tell he's smelling scent and following the track, then I'm going to go ahead and let go of the check cord and let him figure it out on his own. At this point, the dog is pretty much training himself. He's learning to rely and trust his nose, realizing that if he stays on the scent, he's going to get to the end of the, the track and find his reward, which is a bird. It's a little hard to see in this video, but you should see Remy lose the track a little bit. He realizes, ah, I gotta go back to where I last smelled it. So he's gonna go back and pick up the track again and follow his nose a little better. It's good to see him starting to figure things out and realize that good things are gonna happen if he slows up a little bit and trusts his nose rather than just starts out in a search. So we're gonna see him follow the track a little bit and find the bird and He'll get his reward. So I think this is turning out to be a pretty great training exercise. I can tell he's learning to trust his nose and follow the track a little better and pretty soon he's gonna catch up with the bird right about here. He's gonna get his reward and he's gonna come back a happy camper. So we found the bird and he's on his way back. Time to check the delivery to hand. And didn't do that so well. So we got some work to do to clean up that and get that polished up. One thing I've learned is it's good to train in different areas. It's good to give the dog exposure to different field conditions. In this particular track that I'm going to lay out, I'm not going to have any real hard bends. I kind of want to make sure that the dog is going to follow a, the scent and not necessarily break out in search going back and forth. So here we go. He picks up the scent immediately, so I let him go. It's amazing to me how quickly he can cover ground while following the scent. According to the NAVDA rulebook, the utility drag should be between 1 and 200 yards, depending on the terrain. This particular drag was about 150 yards or so. My goal was to have Remy complete this task in under a minute. That includes following the track, finding the bird, returning it, and delivering it to hand in under 60 seconds. And you can see Remy starting to head back now, so mission accomplished. He clocked this task in right at 50 seconds, that's 10 seconds to spare. And about half the time it took me just to walk it out there in the first place. And he had a pretty good dang good boy. delivery too, so good way to go Remy. Good boy, yeah. Remy did so good on the last drag that I decided to make this one even harder. This drag is about 200 yards and has a couple significant bends in it where I switch directions and zigzag through the field. It took about two minutes to walk the, the bird out there, so we'll see if Remy can still get it done under the goal of one minute. So here we go. I lead him up to the feather pile and he catches the scent immediately and just takes off on a dead run. I don't know how he can possibly be following a scent running that fast. But so far he's right on track exactly where I dragged that bird. You can see right about here where he runs past the, the bend in the track, immediately recognizes it and does a bout face and gets right back on the track and continues on. And it looks like he's right about where I left that bird. 
And bam! Looks like he's got it and he's off to the races to get back. If you happen to get your stopwatch out and time this, it looks like he's getting it done right at the 60 second mark. And another fine delivery. Way to go, Remy. Good boy, that's a good dog, that's a good boy, yeah. Moving on to the water group. Here we have search for a duck, walking at heel, remaining by blind, steadiness by blind, and retrieve of duck. Let's get started with the search. A good duck search will require the dog to cross the body of water and immediately begin searching on the other side and continue doing so for about 10 minutes. Remy hesitated there and I had to give a follow-up command to get him to cross the water, which would have undoubtedly lowered his score. The duck search is one of the sections that you need a perfect score to get a prize won, so it's really important I get this nailed down. It should be noted that during the duck search, the dog does not need to find the duck during the duck search to get a perfect score. They just need to cross the water and keep searching for 10 minutes on the other side. In fact, when I took the test last year, the judges didn't even put the duck on the other side of the bank. Rather, they put it on the same bank that I was standing, which I still think is a little strange. In the event that the dog does find and retrieve the duck well under the 10 minute time span, the judges may ask you to resend the dog just to complete a 10 minute search. For this reason, it's important the dog gets used to spending as much time on the other side searching as possible before coming back. If you've ever heard the advice that you should air your dog out before running a dog in a test, this is probably why. You don't need him taking a potty break right during the, the test. Whenever I set up the training scenario for a duck search, I always make sure I place at least a couple ducks or dummies with sand on it on the other side as I want to give the dog ample opportunity to find a duck and retrieve it. That just instills in the dog that there's some sense of purpose in crossing the water and finding something they can't readily see. So far, Remy's been doing an okay job looking for the duck on the other side and expanding his search. I've always heard, though, that you should expect the unexpected. I have to admit, though, one thing I never expected during a duck search is for another dog to show up as my dog's retrieving the duck. He kind of looks at him, looks at the other dog, and I have to give him a little, hey, stay focused whistle, just to get him to come back. I think it's good, though, to have some of these unexpected distractions during a training session. Kind of helps to see how they're going to react in certain situations. Remy's returning this first bumper in about three minutes. The judges would most surely want to resend just to complete the 10 minute search. And again, he stumbles out of the gate, which is not something you want on test day. I assume it might be a, another distraction with the dog on the other side that he's focused on. But he's got to learn that command is command and he's got to go the first time. So we're going to keep working on that. One thing I think is important on the duck search is always set them up for success. They've got to make sure they find something on the other side to keep them motivated. He's still on the other side searching, which is a good thing, but I do have to give him a little pep talk just to keep him motivated which on test day would be taboo. The less you say on test day, the better. So this is a great training opportunity here. He thinks he's done his job and can't find the bird and it's time to come back. I have to hold my hand up and say, nope. 
Your job is to keep searching or wait until I call you back. And that's the name of the game we're trying to play here. The idea here is I'm trying to build up the amount of time that he feels comfortable and safe staying over the other side and continuing his search. The problem with duck search videos, and this one is no exception, is they can get a little boring and dry just sitting and watching a dog do his thing on the other side for 10 minutes. Fortunately, I had a pelican start swimming by just to give me a little entertainment, something to check out. That is nature at its finest. Thanks, Rodney. Okay, 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 okay. I think I proved the point. Ten minutes is a long time to do a duck search. And I don't want to bore you with this anymore. So let's move on to the next thing to bore you with. So my training has been centered around trying to get Remy to cross the water quickly and eagerly without any hesitation. So while he jumped the gun a little bit there, I was still excited to see him wanting to cross the water as quickly as possible. Since he crossed the water so well last time, I'm going to have a little more constraint here and make him heal by my side and not send him until I'm ready. And he still has a good entry into the water, so that was good. It's also good to see him know that crossing the water is the name of the game and not searching the, the close bank. So, progress, progress. Like in other sections of the test, I like training in different areas just to let him know that it's the same game regardless of where it's played. The distance across this body of water is almost 70 yards, so that's above and beyond what I'm expecting on the test, so this is a good training ground for sure. When training Remy to take the test the first time, I never thought to shoot above the water before sending him across. Then on test day, when they ask you to do that, I think it threw him for a little loop, as it was a new variable that he hadn't been introduced to before. So, now I make it a habit to shoot my gun before sending him across the first time. It should be pointed out, too, that you're only allowed to shoot your gun the first time you send your dog. If the dog returns the duck and you need to send him back out, you're not allowed to shoot again. So it's always good habit to practice sending them out without that extra shot. Although I thought he hid the ducks pretty well on the other side, it didn't take him long to find the duck and bring it back. So I'm gonna send it back again. Good thing I planted more than one duck over there to give him something to find. 10 minutes is a long time to watch a duck search video. So I'm gonna do a little time-lapse action here and Leave the timer on there to show the total elapsed time. I really didn't hide the ducks over there as well as I should have. I wanted them to spend more time over there searching rather than retrieving the duck. But I'll give them credit for doing the task at hand and that is finding and retrieving the duck. Sending them across the water and having them come back three different times equates to over 400 yards of swimming in the water. That's a sign of a good water dog and you gotta love that. Well, here we are approaching the 10 minute mark, so mission accomplished on the duck search. Good job, Remy. Walking at hill is something that can probably be overlooked, yet it is just as important as the steadiness or remaining by blind as far as points is concerned. So I think it deserves its due diligence. 
Remy's just kind of showing off his healing ability a little bit in this video. He's not always this good. One of the ways I like to train him to heal though is to get in an open area like this. If he ever starts getting too far ahead of me, I just turn left and kind of cut him off. Sometimes I just find myself walking in circles. But that teaches him to back up a little bit and get him right where I want him. I also like to play with the speed. Sometimes I walk fast, sometimes I walk slow, sometimes I stop, just to make sure he stays focused and attentive all the time. It's interesting to me that healing is part of the water group. Why the water group? I don't see anybody healing their dog in the water. Up to the water, maybe, but not in the water. Can anybody explain why this is part of the water group? He definitely knows how to play this game and what's expected of him. Now we just need to get him to do it consistently when there are other distractions and things going on around him. Since the utility test requires you to heal your dog through a series of stakes, it only makes sense to practice doing that as well. I even went through the course holding my gun as if it were a real test. It's actually a good idea to take a dog through the healing course with the stakes, just to give them a better sense of what the stakes are, what they mean, and what they're expected to do. You can see here that Remy attempts to go on the outside of one of the stakes rather than in between them, so I have to stop him and correct him and send him back through. Doing that a few times will hopefully send the message of what he's supposed to do. During the actual utility test, it's okay to have a leash on your dog. You just have to make sure that it's got a lot of slack in it and that he doesn't tug or pull on the leash. I'm not using a leash here because I want to train beyond the test to make sure he understands what he's supposed to do. I do think, however, that during the test I'll put the leash on just as a safeguard if something were to happen. Remy really seems to have a handle on this. But I'm also well aware this is a controlled environment without any dogs or people around. So I do need to plan accordingly and practice with some other distractions. So I understand that remaining by blind is part of the water group, but that doesn't mean I necessarily have to train this by the water. Essentially all I'm doing is setting the dog up, making him stay, walking out of sight, having some distractions by shooting my gun and throwing a dummy out in front of him. I can do that anywhere. This is another one of the training situations where it's kind of difficult to make any corrective action to your dog when you're out of sight. If you're out of sight of the dog, then the dog's out of sight of you. It would really be helpful to have other people available to make any corrections when you're out of sight. So like I try to do with all these training segments is I try to do it in different locations just so the dog doesn't get too complacent or comfortable in one general area and learns to obey in all the different settings. I'm going to walk a little farther away in this video than I did in the previous one. Again just building up the dog's tolerance for separation. I'm also training beyond the test as I wouldn't expect the distance to be this far during the, the actual utility test.
All right, mission accomplished there. He remained steady by the blind through that whole sequence, so I'm gonna reward him with the retrieve for a job well done. Boy, that's a good dog. Good boy. Good boy. Now that we've got the steadiness mastered on land, we can move next to the water. And add a little excitement by having a dummy splash in the water. During the utility test, the handler is required to be out of sight and fire two shots about 10 seconds apart from each other. Adding the throw of the dummy into the water for the added splash is just something I've done again to train above and beyond the test. I'll also fire a third shot just to mix things up a little bit. So far, his steadiness has been pretty dang good. So I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna reward him with that retrieve. I have to keep reminding myself that just because he's done it right doesn't mean he's 100% consistent. So I'm gonna keep training until he can't get it wrong. I'm going to stay away and remain hidden here longer than I would expect to during the test. I just want to make sure that he's got a solid foundation of his steadiness while I'm not around. Again, I'm training beyond the levels of the test. You'll also notice that I threw out some decoys here just to make it a little more realistic scenario is what you'll expect on testing day. He's doing great here. I'm still several months away from the actual test day, but I've just got to remember to keep at it and make sure he doesn't get out of practice. If he does this good on test day, I'll be a happy camper. Just a quick little tip here. Make sure you have a firm grip of the bird before issuing the release command. Otherwise, you might get dinged on the delivery, which would be no fault of the dog. Well, here we are again. Different day, same scenario. Just want to make sure we're working on the consistency so we're not leaving anything to chance. Want to make sure he's got that solid foundation that we can rely on. 
One thing that still has me a little concerned, though, is I'm doing this just by myself without the distraction of other people and other dogs running around. Although the retreat is not part of the evaluation of remaining by blind, I left this part of the video in to show that Remy just did not even care that the decoys were out there. He didn't stop to check them out or smell them. He's been duck hunting enough to know what those are and to leave them alone. Ow. Good boy. Steadiness by blind is one of those things that we've kind of been working on all along through out all of these different sections. But here are some drills that I've been doing for a while just to get to where we are today. The objective here is just to train the dog that it's not up to him just to go fetch the bumper or bird whenever he wants but he's got to wait for the command. Rather than just a simple fetching drill, we added gunfire as just a little extra temptation to get him to jump the gun, so to speak. All right, he did so good there that I'm gonna reward him with getting all of those retrieves. If he wasn't so steady, then I would have called him back, made him sit, and watched me fetch all the bumpers. That would have been no fun. The interesting thing here is I send him after the orange bumper and he comes back without it. That didn't really please me too well. That seems to be a trend with that orange bumper. So I did a little research and I found out dogs don't see orange, so it's harder for them to find them. That's a natural reaction, I guess. In this video, I'm gonna mix it up a little bit. Rather than throwing one bumper at a time, I'm gonna throw three at a time, and we'll see if that tempts him to break. Nope. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a full circle and walk behind him and see what he does. And he starts to turn with me, which I don't really want him to do, so I'll give him a little correction and let him know that that's not what I want him to do. I'm going to add just a little variation to this one. Rather than throwing the bumpers and shooting right by them, I'm going to get a little separation like it was a real blind scenario. Throw the bumpers, shoot the gun, and see how he does in this setup.
and we've got the same good results, so that's awesome. Way to go, Remy. Okay, it's time to put it all together. Let's see how he does. I'm gonna set him up next to the water as if he were in a blind, and we're gonna tempt him by throwing the bumpers and shooting the gun, and we'll see how steady he is. Well, all right, that was pretty dang cool. He hardly flinched during the shot. Final test is to walk behind him, make sure he doesn't turn around and nailed it. All right, retrieve of duck will be the final section we're gonna be covering in this video. We've kind of been doing this all along, but repetition is never a bad thing. What we're looking for here is a good delivery to hand. I can tell that Remy's been a lot more consistent as we've been recording these videos, which I like to see. This was a pretty good presentation, but I don't want to take anything for granted, so I'm going to walk around and make sure he stays steady and is not anticipating dropping the, the bird out of his mouth. I'm still using bumpers in these videos, but I will need to use a bird at some point to make sure he's doing the task with a mouthful of feathers. Not bad, Remy. Not bad at all. Like I've said before, I always like doing these exercises in different areas just to give them a, a good sense that it doesn't matter where the game's being played. And here we are wrapping it up with uh, Retrieve with a dead duck with real feathers in his mouth. We'll see how he delivers the hand. And oh. not bad. Good boy. Yep. You should be getting a sense through all the repetition that Remy's really knowing his job and what to do and how to do it. So I'm liking the progress so far. What I really liked about this sequence is this delivery was after about a 140 yard swim in the water, so he wasn't anxious to drop the bird or shake off, and I think that was a good uh, show of constraint right there. Good boy, good boy. Well, that's it for the training video. I actually recorded this footage about a year ago and took the test last fall. In case you're wondering how he did on the test, well, he did great in some areas and not so good in other areas. He got a perfect score in search, remaining by blind, steadiness by blind, retrieve of dragged game, uh, the duck search, uh, which I spent a lot of time on, 
Uh, but unfortunately, it was the steadiness on game that got us this time, and so unfortunately, did not even get a prize. But looking back at the past year, I wouldn't trade the, the time we spent training and, and hunting for any score. It's been a great experience and learning uh, effort for, for me. Hopefully, in the course of this video, you've learned a thing or two, uh, maybe learned from my mistakes. Um, I wish you all the best. If you do have any advice for me, um, this is the first dog and only dog I've ever trained for the utility test, so I've got a lot to learn myself. But if you have any advice for me, please leave it in the comments. Uh, but I wish you well in your training and, and hunting efforts. And with that, good luck.